morning and welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2013 uh, visiting, visiting Scientist Program. This is the second talk in that program. We uh, welcome today David Weitz from Harvard University. I want to take a minute first to remind you, uh, as we approach the end of the year, and I'll celebrate a little bit now. This is also the last convocation in our series of convocations this year. We started with um, the title and the phrasing of many um, voices, bold visions, and the question, what power can an individual have in a world of almost seven billion? And so we've had a series of convocations to, to, to really highlight and focus um, individual voices speaking powerful words. We started with Ibo Patel and his interfaith dialogue. We moved on to a range of topics, including the science of hope, recycled housing even. Um, in the middle somewhere, an amazing Peace Prize forum this year that featured two Nobel Peace Prize winners, Dr. Paul Farmer and our own Peter Augre with a day devoted to science and health and their role in developing world peace or promoting world peace. We uh, finished last week with uh, Ms. Gloria Steinem. And today, you know, I always say we save the best for last. We have a, a talk that really highlights, you know, something that we're highlighting this week, and that is uh, a major new gift for our Center for Science, Business, and Religion combining uh, some powerful ideas in a place. So I would like to introduce maybe Professor Weitz in a way he hasn't been introduced uh, before. And that is someone who actually um, is a role, or at least uh, highlights what happens when those things come together. He is a scientist that is interdisciplinary. He's worked across the disciplines, physics and biology, materials research, and has published over 500 uh, papers in his research career. He is also an entrepreneur and an innovator. He has co-founded at least four companies, has more than 50 patents. And um, he is also, as we saw last night, someone who wants to bring his love of science to the wider community. And he uh, has achieved uh, what we all desire as professors is that rock star status, offering a course that has students beating down the doors he did this by combining his love of physics with uh, something that we experience every day, and that is food and cooking. And so his course at Harvard uh, that he tells us will be um, soon to be delivered uh, online to everyone next fall, the physics of cooking, really reaching out to the world and um, sharing the, the beautiful ideas of science. Today, we have a poetic title of Dipping, jetting, drops, and wetting. We will describe to you the world of microfluidics and some of the promising applications of them. Thank you all. <coughs> Hope you enjoy the talk. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for coming. And, uh, uh, I may be somewhat uh, controversial in what I tell you at the end of this talk, and you'll see what I mean. I hope I'm not. Um, but I'm going to tell you actually something that is perhaps, uh, so uh, as Warren, this is going to be a different introduction than it was, uh, but maybe what I'm going to tell you, in a sense, does indeed fit in with this theme that you have. Um, I want to tell you about something that in some sense has revolutionized uh, what we do and how we do things. Uh, it's a revolution that you probably haven't heard of. It's a revolution that you will hear of, I think. It's a revolution that um, changes the way, or it will change the way you do things. And it's a revolution that I won't really be able to describe that, I can compare this part, but it is a revolution that in my mind will um, bring science to everyone and will make medicine accessible to the whole world and in fact will personalize medicine for each and every one of us. Um, this is what this revolution will do. And I'll try and give you just a hint of that. Uh, I won't be able to tell you all of that. Uh, let me say at the outset that the work I'm going to describe is work that's been carried out in my uh, research group for 
nearly 10 years, not quite. Um, and we've had many, many people who've contributed. So everything I'm going to tell you is really uh, from them, not from my own work. Uh, the only thing I can really claim responsibility for is any mistakes that I might make. Uh, most of what I'm going to tell you about today is probably the work of Anderson Shum, who is now a professor in Hong Kong. He is a, a, was a really a wonderful student. I'll try and show you some of the beautiful things that he did. Uh, Jeremy Gressy, who now works for Biorat, did a lot of the other work. Uh, and this whole group of people have contributed uh, over the years. I'll try and point out some of their particular contributions. So, if you look around, how many people here own a cell phone? Oh, sorry. How many people here don't own a cell phone? <laughs> you, can, you can join in the revolution there, for less. <laughs> Do you own a computer? Yeah. Okay. When I, when I studied physics as an undergraduate, this is what I studied, a vacuum tube. How many people here actually know what a vacuum tube is? Yeah, you're all old and grizzled, just like me. Um, there's been a revolution in electronics. That's what makes cell phones possible. That's what makes computers possible. This is the way things used to switch. This is the way the telephone network was switched. And everybody was very happy about that because they no longer had to call an operator who would then plug in uh, a wire to switch things. But the problem is that this is a very inefficient device. It creates a lot of heat. And so to try and overcome that, the transistor was invented. And that's really the driving force for the invention of the transistor. Uh, that's also a very old device. Uh, I studied that in, uh, in, um, uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, it uh, evolved to an integrated circuit. And the integrated circuit evolved to the microprocessor. And there's a constant evolution and revolution now of microprocessors. In fact, the worry is that we are running out of space to uh, evolve the microprocessor and we have to find new technologies. But that's a different story. But this constant revolution of electronics you're all familiar with and you're familiar with the, particularly if you're trying to take a picture right now using a cell phone or if you use a laptop computer. This is what drives all this revolution and the whole world has changed because of that. There is a similar revolution going on uh, when you do chemical reactions, when you manipulate fluids. This is a way that now you can go into a lab and you can do chemical reactions. You take a fluid and uh, move fluids around, mix fluids together using these little pipettes. How many people have actually used a pipette? About half of us. When I, when I went to school, we didn't use pipettes, but <laughs> very bad thing, don't do that. Now you use these automatic pipettes. This is actually old, old, old technology. Now you have machines that do it. You have robots that do this. And each reaction doesn't take place on this little uh, uh, test tube, but rather in these wells of these micro titer plates. And what that does is it automates doing chemical reactions. It makes it much faster. Uh, and this has really uh, in, significantly improved our ability to find drugs. And I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. But even this is uh, an old style. This is now uh, evolved. And these well plates are now replaced by these chips. This is a big magnification. Do I have a, yeah, here's the blow up of this. This is a big magnification of a microfluidic chip. Basically what we've done is we've taken the technology that uh, was used to create microprocessors or uh, electronic microelectronic devices from about 20 or 30 years ago, and we've applied it to control not electrons, not current, but fluids. And this is a microfluidic chip. This is many generations old. This is uh, developed by uh, Steve Quake, one of the real founders of this field. And this has also revolutionized fluids much in the same way that microprocessors and microelectronics have revolutionized electronics. We, it, it's still not as widespread yet as is microelectronics, uh, but it will become fairly widespread. It won't have the same impact. Its impact will be more selective, but it will have a big impact. Uh, there are already a number of applications that this is used. The inkjet printer, for example, is really nothing more than these microfluidic devices. There are a number of applications, but for diagnostics and personalized medicine, this will become the way things are done. So 
The most important application for microfluidics will be lab on a chip. You will take a whole lab and you'll miniaturize it onto a single chip. And I'll show you examples of that. This is going to uh, revolutionize what you can do in a laboratory. It's going to revolutionize what you can do with diagnostics. Uh, it's going to make everything affordable, just like the microprocessor does. It's going to make everything. It's going to bring uh, the ability to manipulate fluids to the whole world, not just to the, uh, the first world which can afford it, but to ev all the world, including parts of the world that can't really afford these yet. It's going to bring applications in healthcare. It's going to open that up to everybody. But I want to start not with this story. I want to start with the fact that you can also use this in a very unique way to synthesize materials. And I want to show you a little story about how you can make new kinds of materials, materials that you can't make otherwise, but that you can now make using microfluidics. And I want to show you some interesting things, some important things, and some fun things that you can do with this. Everything I'm going to tell you about is something that we do in my group, which is slightly different than it's normally done. We don't uh, just manipulate single fluids, but rather we manipulate multiple fluids. We, we manipulate two, three, four, a number of different fluids together. And what we in particular are uh, particularly interested in are making drops of one fluid in a second fluid. So you actually know all about drops. Um, when you had coffee this morning, did you put milk in your coffee? Or did you put milk in your cereal? Milk. Milk is just drops of one fluid and a second fluid. Homogenized milk, you, mil you, you uh, mix the milk very with, with large forces to make small drops of fat in the, in the water. That's what turns milk white. So whole milk is more white than 2% milk, which is itself more white than skim milk because you have more drops of fat. The drops of fat are about a micron in diameter. They scatter light. That's why they look white. But what they do, they're drops, they contain the fat in the fluid. So drops can encapsulate one fluid, in this case fat, in a second fluid, which is water for milk. So that's the, most, uh, the important thing about, uh, about drops, and I'll come back and use that when I describe how you can use it for lab on a chip applications. But we can also use the fact that each drop wants to be spherical. Whenever you have one fluid and a second fluid, it always wants to be a sphere. And it's a perfect way of making a spherical object. And you can use that spherical object as a template. You can build new structures around that sphere. And so you can use that to fabricate new materials. And I'll try and show you how we can actually fabricate new kinds of materials using this uh, a drop of one fluid in the second. And by using the control that's afforded by the microfluidics, we can really do something interesting and different. And the way to understand the microfluidic device in this case is that it's a structure where you mix fluids together at exactly the size that you want to make them. So everything is miniaturized and you make the drops exactly the way you want to make them. So the right way of the analogy would be if you think of milk, the milk has billions or trillions of drops in each glass. Imagine me making each drop one at a time and making something very special. Now, for making milk, you won't want to do it, but I'll try and convince you that there are reasons that you do want to do this. And then you should ask me, is this an academic exercise? Because imagine making milk one drop at a time. You'd think I was crazy, especially if I wanted to do something to actually make a real material out of it. You'd think I was absolutely insane. Of course, when, when I tell you that you're absolutely crazy. By the way, many companies have thought about that. They've always said you can't do this. I always say when you can't do something like that, when you really can't do it, that's a great project for a graduate student. <laughs> I'll try and prove you it is. Okay, so how do you make drops? Well, I told you how you make milk. The most common, uh, easily understood um, kind of uh, drop is an emulsion. That's what milk is. I talked about it last night. This is a good example. This is Anderson's example. It's a vinaigrette, oil and vinegar. This is the vinegar, this is the oil. I don't show the interface here, but the oil always floats on top of the vinegar. Oil and vinegar are like oil and water. They don't mix. How do you mix them? Well, you shake them, right? You shake them up, 
There's Anderson shaking it up. And this is what you end up with. You end up with drops of vinegar in the oil. Or oil and vinegar, oil, or drops of, of oil in the vinegar, depending which is the, the dominant phase. But this is what you end up with. And if you shake, you end up with things like this. You end up with drops of all different sizes because you're just shaking them. Well, that's great for making vinaigrette. And we did that last night. But if you really want to make something to do science with, you want things that are absolutely uniform in size that look like that. And I want to tell you how to make drops that look like this. All exactly the same in size. And the way we do it is to start with a different kind of microfluidics. It's something that we developed in my lab to do something very fast, very quick, and to learn how to make new kinds of structures. And we took advantage of uh, a technology that's very, very highly developed in biology labs. We can go down to uh, uh, various bi biology labs and learn how to do this very quickly. We start with these capillary tubes. These are one millimeter in diameter, they're outer diameter, they're cylindrical, they're one millimeter in diameter, and they have an inner tube on the inside that's also very precisely controlled. And you can take these things, and a very, very simple way, what you do is you take one of these uh, capillary tubes, they're made of glass, you heat the middle of it up, you heat it up to it's very close to the melting point of the glass, and then you pull it like this. And if you do that, you end up with a structure like this. This is taken with a camera. I'll show you some microscope images in a bit. You'll see that the orifice here is absolutely perfectly controlled. You can do that very reproducibly. You can do that very easily. There's actually just machines that do this. And you can make orifices that you start with a one millimeter outer diameter. You can make orifices that are as small as a micron or a fraction of a micron. We typically use orifices about 10 microns in size. So we take this. And then we want to align things, we want to build devices, so we use a second trick. We have to align a bunch of cylindrical, if I go back, cylindrical capillaries that look like this. So for that trick, to do that, what we do is we use another very easily accessible device, a square capillary. And the inside dimensions of this square capillary exactly match the outer diameter of the cylindrical capillary. So we can just thread the capillaries through that. And that makes it very easy to align. So we thread this through this, and we make a device that looks like this. this is a schematic. This is the inner capillary. It's cylindrical. It's fit inside this outer capillary, which is square. We can put one fluid. We can flow one fluid through the inside and a second fluid through the four interstices here. There's not much space around it, but remember, it's a cylinder inside or uh, a circle inside of a square so there's four spots on the outside you can do that very easily this is narrowed down so it's so narrow that the fl fluid doesn't flow very fast through this one and we can easily flow fluid around it and we can make drops that way this is what the device looks like this is built in the lab Anderson great student he can put this together in about half an hour it's all held together with something very simple. I told you we do very simple things. It's all held together just with five-minute epoxy. This is the setup. This is our microscope. This is the device. There's a bunch of different fluids coming in and collection. We just watch with a microscope. We're going to show you lots of images of this. It's all taken with microscopes but with a high-speed camera so you can see things. And this is what it looks like. Here we are making drops. So remember, we're flowing fluid through this narrow orifice. This is about... Uh, 10 microns in diameter. You see the drops are coming out, about one per second. The square capillaries up there and down here, you can't see it in the microscope because everything's magnified. But it's there. The outer fluid is coming around here. It's breaking off the inner fluid. These drops are oil, are water drops in oil. I said they're coming at one per second, but I also told you that everything I'm about to show you is sped up with a high-speed camera. In fact, this is happening at about 5,000 drops per second. But you can see they're all very, very precise. They're all very similar in size. This is what we call the dripping regime. It should remind you of something going drip, 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 drip. We can increase the flow here a bit. And if we do that, we get a jet. Here's the orifice. We're getting a jet. It still breaks up into drops, though. And that's something that always happens. In fact, you can understand this very simply. You can go home and do exactly this, exactly what we're doing in your kitchen tonight. Here's some pictures of our lab. 
You can turn a faucet on, it goes drip, 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 drip. If you flow the fluid very slowly, it forms a drop and it hangs there until it gets large enough to pull itself off. It's just balancing the, for the, the gravitational force of the drop with the surface tension that's holding it there. These drops are all exactly the same in diameter. If you just turn the faucet on just a little bit harder, you get a, a jet. But if you look carefully, if you have it just adjusted right, if you look carefully, just before it hits the bottom, of, hits the sink on the bottom, it will break up into drops. And if you don't believe me, you can do a different experiment. You can take a water hose and you can spray a water hose. But if you spray it as far as you can, it will always break into drops. Because fluid doesn't like to stay as a, cylind a cylindrical flow. It's always susceptible to some kind of instability which breaks it into drops. So it's very easy to make drops. So this is dripping and this is jetting. Well, we can easily use these devices now to go beyond this simple thing, beyond drops, beyond emulsions. And um, Andy Utada was a student with us and he was working with a postdoc, Darren Link. And Darren said, uh, please connect things up together. And Andy, of course, in his ubiquitous way, did it wrong and he discovered something new. We called him Handy Andy. Actually, he was in France for a while and they couldn't pronounce it Andy, they called him Andy. And that was sort of like handy. And he was, he was very handy. And he, w he invented a lot of things that I'm about to show you. This is one thing in particular. So here is our device I showed you. Imagine now just taking this and connecting it the wrong way. So instead of bringing the outer fluid through these four interstices, you bring the inner fluid, you bring the outer fluid th through the same way, but you bring the inner fluid from the opposite side and you force everything to be collected through this narrow orifice. This looks essentially the same. The, same. the di only difference is now this outer fluid has to loop around and force this fluid through the orifice. That's a focusing effect. That's called hydronamic focusing. What's nice about that is both fluids have to, fo uh, have to go through the orifice. So the uh, dimensions of the inner fluid is, are smaller, is smaller because they have to be, um, they have to uh, force, they have, both have to fit through the fluid, through the orifice at the same time. So this is a way of making even smaller drops. It works quite nicely. Here's the uh, dripping case. This now, the outer fluid is here. It's coming from over here, looping around over here. The inner fluid is coming from over here, looping, coming through here. Everything being forced through the orifice and you can see you get this same dripping phenomenon. You can make a jet. Here's a jet. You can't see the orifice here because the index of refraction is more or less the same, but there's a little piece of dust that makes it, allows you to see it. And now you're forming this jet. Downstream you still form drops. So you can do the same thing, but what's nice about this, this is this flow focusing geometry, what's nice about this is, look, I have a lot of space here. So we can align the capillaries very easily. Let's just put a second capillary now. Now we can align this very simply. Here's one, here's a second. We put them together and you can see how easy they are to align. This is now shown with a microscope. So now if I just go back quickly here, now we have the co-flow geometry. This looks like the first thing I showed you and the flow focusing geometry, but now you're flow focusing not a single fluid, but two fluids. And so now you can make something quite different. That's shown here. Here we're, this is a, uh, uh, a device that Anderson made. Here we're making drops. There's, there's a stroboscopic effect from the way the camera is. It looks like they're moving this way, but they're actually flowing in this direction. And if you look carefully, you see there's one, two, three fluids. So I can show it better here. This are just changing the floor weights. Now you're making a drop inside of a drop. You're making a core shell structure. You're making one drop surrounded by a shell of a second drop. And just by adjusting the flow, you can change the thickness of the shell. Here's a very thick one. This is thinner. There is actually a shell here. It's just very, very thin. And so just by controlling the flow rates, you can control the thickness of the shell. Now this is already a very interesting structure. If you don't do it this way, this is what's called a double emulsion. It's a drop inside of a drop. People have used double emulsions. They're still very widely used. People use them all the time. The way you do this is you make the, the first emulsion and you take that and you put it into a second fluid and you make the second emulsion. 
And the first emulsion was already very widely dispersed drops. If you do it twice, you get something that looks like this. These are uh, fluorescently labeled so you can see them. A lot of drops have nothing. These drops have drops inside of drops. These drops have several drops inside. You get really basically a mess. This way you can make them in a much more controlled fashion. Oops. Let me show you why this is interesting. Obviously you can make these core shell structures, but let me show you a very simple thing that you can do. Imagine that I make this core shell structure, and I'll show you examples of that in a minute, but let me show you the schematic. Imagine I make this core shell structure where the outer fluid is water, the inner fluid is also water, but I use a solvent as the shell. And in the solvent, I put something that's a surfactant, a molecule that goes to the interface, a surface active molecule. I can use a, a polymer, I can use a phospholipid, I can use just a surfactant molecule. Then I make this a core shell structure and the surfactant molecules go to this interface and this interface. But let's say that this solvent is volatile and so I evaporate it. Then I'm left with a thin layer of surfactant molecules on the outside and a second layer on the inside. This turns out to be a very useful structure. It's called a, uh, a liposome or a vesicle structure. It can be made with a variety of different molecules. What's useful about this is it can encapsulate something. And you use these structures all the time. This encapsulates things. The way you normally make them is you self-assemble them. So you <coughs> put layers of the surfactant here and you try and fold them around themselves to encapsulate things. That's great, but if you want to encapsulate something very valuable, you encapsulate here, but everything else, the, the valuable drug or whatever it is you're trying to encapsulate, is everywhere. So somehow you have to separate and you basically waste a lot of this very valuable material that you've encapsulated. In this case, this stream and this stream are completely different. So you can encapsulate them perfectly. So this is a very easy way to make structures that encapsulate very valuable materials. Here's an example. These are an example where we've used totally biocompatible polymers. We've used dye block polymers so that they have both amphiphilic and, amph and hydrophilic portions. And we've made this bilayer structure and we've encapsulated just a, a dye here just so we can see it. Everything's biocompatible and we can encapsulate things very well. And Jin Wung works for a company that wants to make these kinds of structures. So he worked with Anderson to develop them. Of course, once you encapsulate something, if you really want to encapsulate something, you also have to somehow release it. I'll show you how you can release it. Here's a simple way. We can push on the outside. We can put a pressure on the outside. You can put pressure on the outside by putting what's called an osmotic pressure, something that pushes very hard on the outside and expels whatever's on the inside. In this case, you just use something like sugar or polymer on the outside. And here's some images of what happens when we do that. The structure collapses. This is over some period of time. And eventually, if you wait, it's completely collapsed, so anything on the inside is going to be driven out. <clears throat> so this is a simple way of, of releasing. There's actually a second way of releasing, and that's you can take advantage of the pressure. There's a pressure on the inside from whatever you're trying to encapsulate. You can take advantage of that and just put a very low pressure on the outside, basically put it into, into distilled water. If you do that, look what happens. This is a case where we put it in distilled water. It grows because it's being blown up and then poof, a little hole develops and it shrinks again. In this case, the same thing happens. It blows up and then it shrinks and then it completely disappears. <coughs> so this is an example of that same polymerosome put under very low pressure. Here's the dye. I'd show you an, a, a fluorescent image here, but there's no more fluorescence left because the dye has been driven out. It's been put under this low pressure and it's blown up. It's blown itself up and it's released things. So I've just showed you how you can encapsulate things and you can release things, and that's a very important thing for uh, one of the main uses of emulsions, remember, is to encapsulate and release. Now I'm showing you how you can design structures that can actually very, in, in a very sophisticated way, encapsulate things and in a very controlled way release them. You can make other structures. You can make a foam. You can put a whole bunch of things in and evaporate things. You get this foam-like structure. <clears throat> you don't have to evaporate the solvent. You can polymerize it. Here's, we've used a resin that's curable by UV. And we've made these shells. These are solid shells because you can't break them. The only way you can break them is to crush them. If you crush them between glass slides, 
they break and they form these structures. You can see that they're broken. You have to really crush them to break them. You can do other things. You can find these capillaries. You don't have to find a single orifice. You can find a double orifice capillary. You just buy these things. They have, these are what we call the theta, but they're various shapes. And you can make, this looks like a Photoshop image, but it's not. It's just a droplet containing two drops of different types of material, or a whole bunch of different types of material. You can make all kinds of different structures like this. But you don't have to stop at these double emulsions, at these drops inside of drops. Liang Yin came to visit us, and he decided he'd build a different kind of device. He built a device that has two in serial, two drop making devices. Here we're making drops, we're flowing them into here. Here there's already two, look what happens. A third comes along, and then this breaks off. There it goes. So now you have three drops inside of it. And if I played this long enough, you'd see that three more drops will come along. But this is a very simple way. Now you can really adjust both the size and the number of drops, and so you get really designer emulsions. Here's examples. You say you want five drops. I say, well, what size do you want? Here's five drops. You can change the size just by controlling them. These are just examples of everything is exactly the same. Just by controlling the, the flow rates, you can control the number and the size of the drops. That's really cool, but what's, what's really even cooler is that, look, one, two, what are we doing here? Well, let's be bold. Let's add a third. And now we can truly make designer emulsions. We can make triple emulsions absolutely precisely. Drops inside of drops inside of drops. We can control the sizing and we control the numbers. Very easy to do. Of course, you tell me, well, this now truly becomes an academic exercise. Instead of doing this three times, I have this perfect control. But let me show you why it's not an academic exercise, why it's really actually very interesting. <clears throat> Here's a structure that's in oil. It's a, a shell. This is an emulsion. This is water in oil. Imagine now that this water contains something really valuable, like some kind of peptide that was really beneficial for you, maybe beneficial for your skin. And there are many instances where you have peptides that are very beneficial for your skin. And you'd like to put it in a cream, but you want the peptide to retain its efficacy. If you make a cream, there's always surfactant in the cream to help it spread, to make it feel good, to help it uh, spread on your skin. That would absolutely destroy any peptide. But if you put a peptide in an emulsion, the oil continues phase, and you wrap it with this gel, then it's completely protected, and it will stay protected. This particular gel is something that is thermosensitive, so as we heat it up, it shrinks. Let me show you what happens when it shrinks. These are some images. We're heating it up. It's shrinking. It's expelling its water. It's trying to compress this, but it can't. It's incompressible. So instead, it tears itself apart and releases the peptide. It releases the emulsion on the inside. So here's a way of making structures that have very sophisticated release characteristics, but also very robust encapsulation. And it turns out that if you want to encapsulate materials, it's very difficult to both simultaneously encapsulate things very, very robustly and have a controlled release. But now, because you have this control over all the layers of the structure, you can make structures that you can control very, very, in a very, very sophisticated way. You're really limited now only by your imagination. Here's a particular structure that we made that's releasing small particles as an example. But what's interesting about this is that when this comes in contact with oil, this shell becomes plasticized, it becomes fluidized, and it actually expels the material. We actually made this structure with uh, resource control, resource recovery in, in mind. This can, it could be a very important uh, structure for improving the recovery of oil uh, uh, from known reservoirs. You can make a lot of other sophisticated uh, structures. Liang Yin has made uh, a much more complicated uh, type of device. But again, just taking advantage of what you can do very easily with these microfluidic devices. And he can make uh, now these multiple emulsions, these triple emulsions, using many different kinds of materials. It's just using it in a very simple way, using your ability to control these capillary devices. So I hope I've showed you that these are interesting. But really, I'm making things one drop at a time. So I had this experience. I, uh, I told Anderson, uh, you know, he, I told you, he makes these devices. Really, he can make these devices, even the triple emulsion devices. He can make them in about half an hour. He's very good. I said, Anderson, can you make two devices that work exactly the same way? He looked at me, of course I can. 
He went back, he went out back to the lab an hour later, one hour, right? Two devices, one hour. He came back, showed me these two devices. I said, well, let's characterize them. So we spent a few hours characterizing, checked each one. They were exactly the same. You know, he really can make them absolutely the same. I said, well, that's pretty good, Anderson. Can we have 10 devices so we can make a you know, reasonable amount of material? He looked at me, he was a little puzzled, and liked the idea. He came back a day later, right? 10 devices, five hours, a day later. He had 10 devices, we tested them. They were really perfect, they really worked really well. And then, so I told him, I said, well, Anderson, really, 10 devices is not enough. How about 1,000 devices? We have 1,000 devices, we can start making a reasonable amount of material. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he turned around and he walked out of my office. He wanted to graduate, he didn't want to spend his time making devices like this. This is the wrong way to make devices. You can't do this to make devices. So you have to somehow parallelize, but you have to do it in a more sophisticated way. Well, fortunately at Harvard, we can go across the street, and there's George Whitesides, who's invented a new technology called soft lithography. He's really been the person to make it into a common uh, technology. And I won't tell you the details of this. I'll just tell you that what you do is you make your microfluidic devices not out of of the standard material that you use for semiconductor industry, but instead out of silicone rubber, the same material that you seal your bathtub. And the beauty of this is you can do it again very quickly. And in my mind, this is what's really uh, uh, been the driver of this revolution, because now you can make devices again in literally two days. For us, it takes two days. I always get nervous. I say, two days, why not one day? Well, the reason is that part of the process this, it, it requires a, a mask that you expose uh, the, the device to with ultraviolet, just to part of making the, it, the device. For making that mask, we do a very complicated process. What we do is we print it. We send it to a printer. The particular printer we found that has the resolution that we want is in Colorado. So we email them the file in the morning and they FedEx it back the next day. There's the one day. That's why it takes two days and not one day. So it's very easy, it's very simple to make these devices. And now, you're making it with a mask. You're printing the device. So if you want to make two devices, it's called copy-paste. You make a design for one, and you copy-paste, you make two. If you want four devices, copy-paste, copy-paste. Eight devices, well, you can see how you can scale that up really easily. So we make these things. Here's an example. This is Adam Abate. He made these uh, double emulsions, so one, two, He's making drops inside of drops. This is just controlling the flow rate, the same way as Lang Yin's devices. You can easily make double emulsions. So you stack them together. Here's triple emulsions. If you look at a blow up, you see it's triple emulsions. Of course, Adam said that Lang Yin already made triple emulsions, so he made quintuple emulsions. Drops inside of drops inside of drops inside of drops inside of drops. It's just stacking them together. It's really easy. Turns out there's a lot of interesting science in this, which I don't have time to go through, but you can make that very easily. Of course, that's not the way you really want to do it. You want to stack these things in a different way so you can make, uh, make lots of drops at the same time. So you want to go into three dimensions. So Mark Romanowski came along to me. He said he'd been a student in a different group. He'd been a graduate student in a different group. He said he'd worked for four years. He got no results. I said, well, okay, what do you, what do you know? He said, he told me what he said. I said, I have a project for you. Build me a device. I'm going to give you 10 a, a cubic liter, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, one liter of material. Make, take that amount of material, I'll give you three pumps, make me a double emulsion so that you can process, in an hour, you can process a liter. So my thinking was, look, if I have this much material, I'm making a liter an hour, let me fill this room with that. Let me make them cheaply and fill the room with that. Then I can start making really a viable amounts of material at the same time. I said, if you do that, you'll publish a really good paper. He did, he published a really good paper, and it was the most downloaded paper that month in the journal it was published. I said, the other thing you can do is you can graduate. It took him about a year and a half, he's now working very happily at a company, because he did graduate. So he made this device in three dimensions. This is just a schematic of it, this is what it looks like. These are some images. <clears throat> I'll play this movie for a bit, you can see there's a double emulsions drops inside of drops, these are a whole bunch of things together, and in a second you're going to see that it comes up into the third dimension, now it comes up into the third dimension, and it's starting to collect now from each device, it's starting to collect a reasonable amount of material. So by scaling this, if you do it properly, you can actually make viable quantities of material. So much so that we actually tried to start a company, we did start a company, 
Jin Woo went back to the company he works at, which is called Amori Pacific, which is a Korean cosmetics company. He said, please will you make us some of these uh, polymers, some of these uh, materials that I developed because we want to sell this in cosmetics. So we were bold enough to actually do this, use microfluidic devices to make this, and he's trying to encapsulate very, va uh, very valuable peptides that are very beneficial for the skin. And in fact, they are now commercially produced by this company, Capsum, um, and sold in Korea. Capsum is a cosmetics company. You might say that that's not the best thing to do. I'll show you why it is a very good thing to do uh, for using microfluidics as a first application. You might think that would be better for drugs. It's actually, there's a, benefit, a reason for doing cosmetics, and that's you don't have to go through the approval process that you do for drugs. You'd have to wait for a, a large number of years. Now it only takes about a year and a half to develop a cosmetic. Um, you want to do something that's high value added. This is high value added. Um, they, Capsum has now developed it, scaled things up, not only in uh, ability to make them, but they actually make larger uh, drops. These are very similar to the caviar that we made last night. This is a production facility. This is actually producing commercial quantities of this caviar, and it's sold now. It was on the cover of CNE News, and it's sold uh, La Prairie. Who, who here really knows something about cosmetics? Nobody wants to admit it. La Prairie is a very high-end cosmetic. This is uh, a new product. It's called Skin Caviar Lift. You look on the, online. This is actually made now by Capsum. I would bring you some of this. I would show it to you. But let me show you what I, why I don't. This is from the website. You go to the next page. Look at the cost. It's $500 for this 50 milliliter thing. That's the advantage of cosmetics. It's very high value added. You might think that, co that, that Capsum really makes a lot of money from this, but the actual amount of material there is about a dollar's worth of material. The real high value added is the... Um, is the advertising. But it's a very good way to start with materials and to prove that you can now make materials in uh, commercializable quantities by uh, using microfluidic techniques. Okay, I want to spend just a few minutes more and tell you the other side of the revolution. This is the revolution to try and do uh, lab on a chip experiments. I want to just give you a little bit of a hint of what you can do. So I showed you how you want to uh, use, uh, or how one now uses uh, these robots to do chemical reactions. What I want to do is replace each of these micro titer plates. A typical volume that you use in a micro titer plate is about 100 microliters. I want to replace that with a drop. And I want to show you that everything you can do with these robots, you can now do with the drops using microfluidics. The advantage of this is that instead of using 100 microliters, you use a drop, and a typical size of a drop <clears throat> is a picoliter. Here's a, um, a little primer about the size of drops. A one micron drop has a femtoliter. That's 10 to the minus 15 liters. A 10 micron drop, and that's what I'm going to talk about, has about a, a microliter, 10 to the minus 12 liters. And let me show you just in the very simple back of the envelope calculation, <coughs> let me show you why that's actually an advantage, why you actually want to use um, uh, a very small volumes. So if you go to a drug company, they, the drug company has produced many, many, many drugs, and it has a whole library of these drugs. It spent all this money producing the drugs. Every time they find some new disease where there's some biomarker, they might ask, can we use the drugs that we've already made to treat that disease? And that's what they do. They use these robots to screen each of these drugs against this new biomarker. So imagine that it's a, a big drug company that has 100,000 compounds. That's actually fairly small. And you want to measure the effectiveness, so you want to do different concentrations. So you might do 10 concentrations. I'm just doing a back of the envelope calculation, but you see where I go. 10 concentrations of 100,000 compounds is a million sets of reagents. That's actually a lot of a reagent. If you use even 100 microliters, it's the smallest thing you can easily pipette. It's a very, very small drop. If you use that, or sorry, I did the calculation for 10 microliters. If you use 10 microliters per drop, that's really small. You're still talking about 10 liters of reagent. 
this is close to a liter, 10 of these. That's the thing that limits the, the amount of screening you can do, just the cost of the reagents. Of course, if you use a machine that goes like this, I did a simple calculation, you have to run that machine for four months at 24-7, and that machine better not break halfway along if you want to screen all the drugs. Now imagine doing it in these picoliter drops. If you use a picoliter per drop with microfluidics, you're using the total amount of reagent as a microliter. It's one drop, one drop that you can see, you can do the whole experiment, the whole screen. And if you do it at 1,000 drops a second, it takes 20, 20 minutes. We can go outside, have a cup of coffee, come back, and we're done. So if we want to do that, we have to be able to do what the robot does with drops. So this is what we have to do. You have to make drops, fill them, you want to split them, combine them. All of these things are things that you do with the robot. Let me just show you now the technology exists using microfluidics to do this. <coughs> so making drops. Well, there's a very simple way of making drops that Steve Quake first developed. That's, it's called this T-junction. And it's just essentially the same thing that I showed you before, but now just slightly different geometry. It's a, it, a junction in the shape of a T. The uh, inner fluid comes here and is pulled off by the flow of the second fluid. Here's an example. You see the water is coming here and oil is pulling it off. You make uniform drops. You can see what happens. The viscous flow causes these particles inside to swirl around. You can make very uniform drops, collect them downstream. They're all uniform. You can change the size just by changing the flow rate. Here the inner flow rate's the same. The outer flow rate's getting faster and faster. They get smaller and smaller. You can do it a different way. This is a T-junction, T. But now there's a small hole, and this is this flow-focusing geometry. You counterflow this continuous fluid, the oil, in this direction and this direction, and you pull the water off. You see, you make very uniform drops. You collect them downstream, they're uniform. So you can make drops. You can fill them very easily. The flow, the dimensions are really tiny here. So the flow is very uniform. And here we're flowing three different fluids. Imagine now just changing the concentration of the three fluids. They don't mix until you form the drops, and then they mix very nicely. You can split drops. Sometimes you want to do two different assays. You want to do one test and the second test. You can split the drops very easily. Again, you use this, uh, this T-junction geometry. Now the drops are coming large enough. They try and go both directions, and they're pulled apart. And they're, if they're large enough, they're pulled apart and broken into two. Here we're breaking them into two uniform size drops. We don't have to. We can break them into small and large, just changing the size. It turns out this depends on the hydrodynamic resistance. That's something that's easily adjustable. You just squeeze down. It's a flexible material. It's sil silicone rubber. rubber. You can squeeze down. You can dynamically adjust the size. You can break the drops many times. Here's an example. One, two, three. We've taken these large slugs. We've broken them into very uniform, very small drops. Notice this now has a very large volume fraction. There's very little of the continuous phase, and that remains here. We can combine drops. Now, it turns out this is the most important thing if you want to start a chemical reaction. You want to take a drop with reactant A, a drop with reactant B, and mix them. This is the thing that actually prevented drops from being used for a long time. It turns out it's very easy. You should, it should not be easy. This is an emulsion. And if anybody, if you've ever worked with emulsions, you know the scourge of working with emulsions, the difficult thing is keeping the drops stable, keeping them come from coalescing. Now I just want to controllably coalesce them. That should be really easy. Well, let me show you what happens. As always, when you do an experiment, at least in my lab, when you do an experiment, the first thing never works. So here's our experiment. We did it. We have a drop maker here, a drop maker here. We're trying to flow them to make them collide with each other. They never even see each other. Well, why not? Well, that, this fluid is always flowing on the bottom. This fluid is always, their flow is laminar. The drops are so small, they never see each other. If the flow streams never cross, they never see each other. Well, that's, of course, an easy thing to solve. You just make the drops a little larger, then they can't go through this orifice at the same time. They have to collide. And you do that, and, oops, we fail again. Look at this. Look at what happens. Here's a blow up. Watch these drops. This is slowed down and blown up. Look, the drops come, and they come very, very close together. They should absolutely coalesce, and they never do. Why is that? Well. The reason actually is very simple. It's the same reason you put oil in your car. Oil keeps the bearings apart. The oil can't drain. It's a viscous fluid. It just doesn't drain fast enough. And that's what's happening here. The oil is never draining, so they never meet. You need to add a different force. So what we did was we added electric charge. 
So here are two drops, they're drop makers, they're coming close together. They never see, they never coalesce, but in this case we've added an ability to put a charge on this drop and a charge on this drop. And the nice thing about electric charge is you can use a plus and a minus, and a plus always attracts a minus. So we put the charge on, we turn on the electric field, look what happens. They coalesce, they coalesce perfectly in a very controlled fashion. This is using charge, you don't actually want to use charge for technical reason, you have to make a chemical reaction to create charge in water. Instead you want to use an electric field. And so here we're bringing drops together, There's some sophistication in why we use a, a large and a small, but you can see you always get pairs of drops. And now we just put an electric field on, no charge, we just put an electric field and we do that and then they come close, the drops coalesce perfectly. Again, we can control the coalescence. Here's a more sophisticated way of injecting a reactant A into some drop as we go along. This is what we call a pico injector. We're injecting literally picoliters of fluid into the drops. Each drop goes by and we inject a small amount of this color drop. The nice thing is that it's controlled by this electric field. So you need this electric field to break the interface. So here we have three pico injectors, but only the third one has the electric field and then only the third one is act actually injecting. And if I play this movie along, these are different colors, you would see that here we're injecting the purple. In a minute, we'll switch the field. We'll inject the, uh, the orange, then we inject the green. This is absolutely controllable. We can inject a controlled amount of any fluid that we want using this electric field. The next thing we have to do is allow some chemical reaction to occur. I'm showing everything with high-speed cameras, so it's going very fast. So you, you can't really see what's happening. If I want to um, uh, allow some chemical reaction to occur, I have to allow the drops to flow for some period of time. Well, I just make a circuitous channel. They flow very nicely. Actually, this is not that good. I can, I can get a 20-minute 20, 20 reaction. If I want to get a much longer reaction, what I, what I have to do is slow down the flow. And I do that by doing what I call the toothpaste flow. I take all the fluid out, and then they flow as a paste. They flow as a solid. Notice how it's a solid. I just have a solid emulsion here. And now the advantage of they don't lose their order. What comes in comes out first. What comes in first comes out first. So it's a very easy way of keeping the order. I have to detect the drops. Well, everything is clear. I can do optical detection. This is just the schematic of the lab looking for optical detection. So that's pretty easy. I have to sort the drops. That turns out to be very important. If I want to do some screening, I want to choose something that really works really well, I have to sort the drops. Oh. I forgot to tell you. I didn't tell you there's a quiz in this, in this talk. If you don't ask me questions at the end, I ask you the question. Why are these drops are coming in our favorite T-junction? They're going left and right randomly. It's not random. You have to tell me why it's not random. Or you can ask me a question at the end of the talk. But what's nice about here is, again, we put some charge on the drops so we can change the field. So now we can say, OK, guys, go all to the right. They all go to the right. Movie's not playing, that's okay. They all go to the right. We can tell them all go to the left, change the field. All we're doing is switching field. In fact, we don't want it to use the charge, we want to use electric field. So here's a device that we've, this is our really sophisticated sorter. This has a detector here and has something that puts an electric field, actually puts a gradient of a field. And now you can see we have two different colored drops. Now we can sort them. And now if we have the field on, you can see we can sort all the drops perfectly. And we can do this at 5,000 per second. We can do it different ways. Here's a pressure device. It's not quite as fast. Here's a different way that's using an acoustic wave. What's nice about this is that we've sorted them into three different uh, channels, uh, depending on the, on the intensity that they're colored. But we can sort them very precisely. Finally, you have to screen a large library. I won't go through the details of this, but what you do is, again, this, just think of emulsions. You have all these uh, materials made in this trays of, of, uh, of drugs, for example. What you do is you take each drug and you emulsify it. You make it into an emulsion, but you put a barcode. Somehow you put a label on each and every drop. And then you do something absolutely heretical. You have all these things carefully separated, and you mix them all together. And then you just take a small aliquot. All you have to do is take a microliter. One microliter gives you enough material for all the, the, the drugs if it's barcoded. And here's an example where we've used something. This is just a readout of the barcode of a number of drops. There are a number of different ways of doing this. So I think I've showed you this. I want to spend two minutes now to um, uh, tell you about an application. Um, 
this is where maybe it's not the best application to talk about, but I think it's still a va very valid application. Um, what about making new materials? So here's a material that's very commonly used. It's a, um, an enzyme. It's called horseradish peroxidase. It's something that you find in horseradish. And what's really good about this is that it, it's an enzyme. It's a catalyst. It operates on a substrate, and it turns the substrate fluorescent, makes it fluoresce. And so this is very commonly used as a readout in biology. And so we asked a very simple question. Can we take this enzyme, and can we improve it? And it turns out that it's very difficult to improve an enzyme. It's very difficult chemistry. To operate on the enzyme is very difficult. So what you do, what you do is what Darwin told us about evolution. You evolve the enzyme. You make a new enzyme by evolving it. You do what nature does. You create lots of mutations of the gene that codes for the enzyme. You take the gene that codes for the enzyme and you make mutations. And you test each and every mutation to see what, which one works better. So here's what we did. We made these mutations and we put each gene, one gene at a time, into a yeast cell. And we tricked the yeast cell. We worked with a group at MIT to trick the yeast cell to produce the enzyme that sits on the surface of the yeast and tries to produce, tries to do what it wants. Most of them won't work. Most of the mutations totally destroy it. But a few of them might work. So here's an example. These are the wild type. These are the yeast. And we just put the, end, put the substrate inside the drop and just watch whether it fluoresces. So here's our experiment. It's really fairly simple. We make lots of mutations on the gene. We put one gene per yeast cell, and we put the yeast cell in the drop. We let it grow for a while. We let it operate on the substrate and ask whether it fluoresces. And then we sort. We take those, ones, those yeast cells that are producing, those enzymes that are producing something, we take those and we sort them. What's nice about that now, when we sorted them, we have them in living cells, so we can grow that yeast up again. And then we can do a sort again, so we can get a very efficient sort. It's a very easy way to sort these things. And we can just ask, do we improve them? So we just use all the devices that we have. Here's the results that we get. The first time we did it, we, we, we um, Took a, a, we made a library of, of mutated yeast that when you first do the experiment, this is the average that you would get if they were all uh, active, if you use just the parent. You get a very low signal. This is the signal that you get, a very low signal, because most of them don't work. The mutation has destroyed the ability of the yeast to work. So you take only that work, you sort them one, two. By the time you're done, you get something that's a little bit better. We're just asking, can you do as well as a parent type, or almost as well? We're not asking, can you do a lot better? And what happens is you find that if you do this, you find something like 100 mutations, 100 muta mutated genes that work roughly as well as a parent type. Not better, but roughly as well. But then what you do is you take those. You take those. You can follow what the mutations are, but you take those and you do a second round of mutation. And then when you do that, you get immediately things that work way, way better. So you've done something really quite interesting here. What you've done is you're asking, I have something that works pretty well. So I'm going, to I'm going to show how things work by a fitness. I'm going to show on the peak of this mountain. I want to go from here to here. I want to make things that work even better. Go to this higher mountain. Taking this leap, I can go in these large valleys. They don't work. So what I did was I did two, two rounds of selection. I did a round of mutation that worked roughly as well. So they came here. And then I did a second round and got to the, the top here. That's called a neutral selection. That's something that people thought you could do, but you couldn't do it until you had this ability to screen this large, large number of materials. And just to give you a hint of why, why this is so powerful, we could do this with robots. We really could do with this, this with robots. But here's why you wouldn't do it. If you did it with a robot, it would take 5,000 liters of fluid to do the screen. We took 150 microliters. It would take about two years we took about seven years to, seven hours, seven hours to do the screen. It would cost $16 million to do with the robot. We tried to amortize everything and try and calculate things. It cost $2.50 to do it here. I showed this to one of my colleagues. He said, well, that's really impressive. Why is it impressive? He said, look, seven hours, $2.50. I don't pay my students very well. So I assured him that the price of labor wasn't included. But this is really now a way of making new materials in a way that you can't do it any other way. This is the only way that you can do it. 
I could go on and on about applications, but I think the time is up, so let me stop here. I've showed you a lot of different things. The beauty of this miniaturization, doing things very rapidly with very small things, is just opening the door now for the kind of applications that you can, you can uh, imagine applying. And the, a large fraction of the group now is working on different kinds of applications of all sorts uh, using this. I've just shown you the, the first application that we did. But I've hoped I've convinced you that you do now, with the power of microfluidics, it really revolutionizes not only the way you can think of doing lab, lab on a chip experiments, but also making new kinds of materials. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have a, a microphone out here if you have some questions for our speaker. The answer is yes, absolutely. We've made drops with metals. Uh, we've made drops with air. Uh, we've used air as the continuous phase, so we've made a spray dryer uh, with microfluidics. Uh, we make gels. Uh, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we're basically limited by our imagination more than anything else. Okay, if there's not another question, I'm gonna ask you my question. You can't leave until you answer my quiz. She's trying to save you all. <laughs> Thank you. She doesn't even have a cell phone. You know, come on. What do you want from her? Um, could you make columns rather than drops? So um, the, the thing about making a column, what you mean is a, is a rod-like structure. And the thing that I showed you well, if you try and make a, a, a jet, which is the beginning of a rod-like structure, you see that it wants to break into drops. So you have to prevent that. There's a very, very uh, uh, ubiquitous hydrodynamic instability that changes a, a cylinder of flow into drops. And you have to avoid that. There are ways of doing it. Um, it's not that difficult. We've done that. Uh, so if you then do that and polymerize or somehow solidify the material before it has a chance to break into drops, then you can make the columns that you're talking about. Thanks, Dave. Great talk. Can you just uh, briefly give us an idea of what you think the most exciting applications of this technology are going forward? Well, for me, right now, the thing that, that we're working hardest on is um, taking advantage of one of the biggest developments in um, biotechnology, and I think soon to be in medicine, and that's the power of sequencing. So uh, right now it's possible, your whole genome, genome could be read, it would take about two weeks, it would cost something like $10,000, um, you'd have more information to know what to do with, but you could do that. Um, that's probably not what's going to be most important if you take it to the clinic. If you actually want to make something that changes your life, that changes how you, how you, uh, your health, what you want to do is you want to look at a small number of your cells that are diseased. You want to understand why they're diseased and you want to ask, can you somehow improve that? So there what you really have to do is look at small numbers of cells, ideally individual cells, in a, li in, a, in a sea of other cells, and you want to do them with enough uh, statistical accuracy that you get some information. So what you want to do is sequence some small fraction of each and every cell, but uh, label it so that you know it comes from an individual cell, so you know information at a single cell level. It turns out that you can do that, but what you do is you encapsulate a cell in a drop, you uh, put something that will pull out those fraction, those particular genes that you're interested in from the gen genomic material in the cell, and you barcode it with that drop. So single cell sequencing is going to be, to me, the next sort of big area of trying to understand for, for biotechnology. And that's what we're really working on very hard. I think the only way you're going to be able to do it with enough statistical accuracy is using drops. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question actually kind of goes off of that. Do you see applications in pharmacogenomics, um, taking an individual's cells, looking at uh, potentially their particular mutations that might cause their disease, and then um, even potentially testing uh, their disease against a battery of drugs? 
you can dream as well as I can. Absolutely. So um, imagine, uh, I'll tell you like three things that, that we and others are working on. The first thing is that um, if you want to detect uh, cancer, the most dangerous period of cancer is when it metastasizes. And then it has to, the, the cells, the cancer cells spread through your blood. There are always a small number of cancer cells in your blood. So if you can take a small fraction of blood, if you can isolate those cancer cells, and there are now ways using microfluidics to do that, then you can test them. You can, for example, a sequence those those parts of the cells that you really want to, you're, you're really interested in. You actually don't want to sequence the whole genome. That's too much information. You want to sequence just a very small fraction of it. So there are instruments based on drops that came out of my lab that now there's actually uh, commercially available. The first instrument was shipped, I think, this week to do the sequencing of just those regions that you want to do it. Then imagine you can isolate those cells and you can sequence, we, we can't do this yet commercially, but you can, you can sequence just those cells that you're interested in. You could, for example, take, um, and we have uh, ways that we, we're doing this where we look for colon cancer. You, you just look at, look for, because you can sequence individual cells, you can identify the presence of um, cancerous cells in part and 10 to the 7. So very, very small fraction of the cells, you can see that. Now imagine you could take, um, for, let me dream even, go, go beyond that. Let's say you, you have a tumor from a cancer. There are a number of things you could, you could do, for, you, for example, you can take the individual cells and you can treat them with the drug cocktail that's normally used. The problem with drug cocktails, if you, if you look at, at, the pro, at the way it's used, <clears throat> you, can, you can reduce cancer using drugs, using chemotherapy, but very often what happens is that eventually new mutations uh, uh, occur that beat the, 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 the cells, because they, they can mutate so easily, they beat the, the, the drugs. If you can tell which cells those are and can identify them by doing sequencing, for example, then you can find the right drugs that will, will prevent those mutations from occurring. So you can do even better. So that's treating the individuals. Now let me dream even more. So, you're, it's very likely that your body has developed antibodies against the tumor, but the antibodies are just not effective enough. They can't actually destroy the cancer. So let me take the B cells that you've got and let me uh, um, match them against the tumor cells and see when, they're, when they actually bind to the tumor cells. Then let me take the antibodies that your body has developed and make them more effective at killing cells and feed them back into the body. So now you have a very natural way of treating the disease, taking your own body's ability to identify the disease, but just enhancing it. So that's what I consider to be really true personalized medicine. And you can't really do that yet, but this is the kind of technology that you need to be able to do it. You need to be able to do screening, you need to be able to use small amounts of material, you need to be able to do single cells. This is the kind of thing that's going to make that all possible. So that's what I dream about. So this question may bring the discussion from the lofty to the pedestrian. Um, I'm here, I will confess, not as a scientist, but as a consumer. And so I'm really curious um, in the applications that you described uh, in cosmetics, um, in La Prairie and some of the other ones, uh, are these creams actually better? And will they make me look young forever? <laughs> Um, so now you're not being pedestrian, you're being a little uh, exotic if you want to look young forever. The answer is no, nothing will ever make you look young for yet, forever. Will it help? The answer is yes. So this is not pedestrian, this is actually very interesting. Um, the, the power of being able to make things drop by drop allows you to make completely new kinds of materials. So Capsum, the small company that we've started, has really exploited this. These materials are not yet on the market, but they will be very soon. What they've been able to do is make a cream that has no surfactant. So if you use your skin cream to put on your, on your skin, surfactant, you need the surfactant because you need to mix the oil and water to make, make the cream, but that's actually not very beneficial to your skin. Now we can make a cream, because we can coat the drops in a totally different way, we can make a cream that has absolutely no surfactant in. There's a, one of the very largest um, uh, cosmetics companies has just licensed that, is going to buy this and, and market it. I can't yet tell you what, what the company is, but it's one of the largest ones. You would know immediately what it is. Another thing you can do with this, 
If you use perfume, if you spray perfume on your skin, like to, to smell, I mean, it's, we all use it in some way, shape, or form. Perfume typically is a hydrophobic molecule. It's an oil-like molecule, and you want to spray it with water. So what you do is you mix it with alcohol. That makes the perfume slightly more soluble in the alcohol. That's very nice. It evaporates very fast, but it actually dries your skin because of the, because of the alcohol. So you'd like to make perfume without, uh, without making alcohol. By making an emulsion, if you can make a, uh, an emulsion of this oil-like molecule in water, you can make a perfume that doesn't use a surfactant. You can't do that with normal technology, but with microfluidics you can. And so now that's another material that they've made. And I think it's not, it's not perfected yet, but I think it will be. You'll have a totally different kind of uh, perfume. So I think that, in fact, um, there are really real benefits of doing it. And, and you may say, well, it's, it's cosmetics. but. Cosmetics are very, a very large and important market. You'd like to look young the rest of your life, so would I. Um, but um, there's actually a really interesting technology that can, you can apply to that as well. Well, let's thank our speaker again. For those of you who are here for the Physics Alumni Summit, lunch will be in the Marshall Room, which is in the Christensen Center. We'll start about 12.30. Thank you.